excellent teachers that are out there who want to get their job. Right? Well, I see them. And, and, and these are some of the things, right? Part of it is voice. They're all helping young people to say or do something that the young people want to say or do in the context of the discipline. Whether that's history or social studies or language or math or science or English. The second is they're building on students' confidence. They're making it relevant to their lives. Affirmation. Right? Adults need affirmation. I was at an award ceremony for uh, an event we hosted, and Bishop Desmond Tutu won an award, and he spoke. And one of the other people who spoke and won an award was about between 80 and 90 years old, and he'd been an educator his whole adult life. And he said, um, if you give an adult affirmation, what do they do? He says, if that person could be 65 years old, if you give them affirmation, they're going to go home and tell their mom. They're going <laughs> to tell their wife and kids. Think about how much, if we need that affirmation, how much do kids need that affirmation? Just how excited are you going to be if you get smashed every day in school? So I find teachers who can affirm kids while they're learning. They're not perfect. We can't wait until they're perfect before we affirm them or else we'll never be affirming them. If all of our feedback is negative and do this and it's red and I can't believe you did this and... That's hard for 20-something, 30-something, 40-something-year-old adults. How hard is that for an 8-year-old? Like, no wonder they get fidgety, right? They want to run out of your classroom. Push students beyond their expectations of themselves. Every student has a definition of excellence. I learned that from watching a state champion uh, cross-country coach. Part of what I do is coach. He took a little tiny school that won the California <laughs> State Championship. We have 6 million students in California. His little tiny school in the desert was the fastest school in the state. And he said, how did you do it? He said, every kid has a definition of excellence. Right? Your definition of excellence is not your definition of excellence. But you have a definition of excellence. And if you don't achieve it, I'm going to say, I know you can do better. Right? Do you better. Don't worry about it. Every student can achieve. Right? That's not defined externally. As a teacher, you develop that with students. Every student can achieve. If you can't achieve, What's your motivation? Right? We think about it. We tell half the students, you're not going to achieve. What's their motivation? To behave. Get on. It's just threat. So great teachers have every student pushing themselves to, their, to, to exceed their best. Um, purpose. That students have a purpose. And that students have an ability to make a difference in the lives of others. And that they're, they're allowed to share their passion and their desire with the world. Right? These are basic principles that I see when I, when I look at classrooms that are the kind of classrooms we want to put our kids in. These are the kind of classrooms where we want to do our student teaching in. The kind of classrooms where uh, parents can't gush enough and they thank you and say, thank you for you know, what you're doing for my kid. The honoring students' voice, they're affirming students. They're, they're, every student has a sense of how far they can be pushed. And, Students want us to be hard on them. They just want us to be fair and give them a chance to succeed. Those have to go hand in hand. So how does all of this kind of translate, you know, into some of the things that, that we might see when we think about college teaching in the 21st century? I'm just going to share a couple of examples of ways that we've done this. Uh, you're probably young enough that you can associate with some of this. Any subway surfer players? Only one. Uh, I don't believe that. Uh, even my, my mom plays something. Uh, my son. Uh, but these kinds of things engage our young people, right? I show this to, I mean, most of that's kind of more in the middle school, but, but they start jumping up, they get excited about these kinds of things. One thing I learned early in my teaching career was that if the students are excited about it, I need to figure out a way to use it to connect it to what I'd like to do because I want them to be excited. The other thing I learned is that a lot of the kinds of skills we want to teach students are being learned as they engage in with these various forms of culture. And so how do we bring youth culture into our classrooms? How do we connect youth culture to the standards? Uh, how do we use it to increase motivation? And how do we use it to increase achievement? Uh, are questions that I've been asking for the 21 years that I've been an educator. But I know in my heart of hearts there's something about Phineas and Ferb. <laughs> That's the one that I'm talking about. For that are out of this uh, There's something about Phineas and Ferb that's going to bring a smile to one of my students' faces, but there's also something about understanding Phineas and Ferb 
that's going to develop some important intellectual skills. Or reading about the cross, or listening to music, um, uh, having conversations about some of these magazine covers. The other thing that we know about youth popular culture is that while there's the excitement level, there's also the danger level. Right? For kids' inability to critically engage these images, they can do very damaging things to themselves. Right? We know as young as fifth grade that girls are starving themselves for more than 24 hours because they're concerned about their body image. And we know, at least in the schools where I work, kids are killing each other. So if, if, if we don't engage youth culture and, and want to tap into it as possibilities, but also help kids to be more critical about it, this is a matter of life and death. Right? I, mean, I, I have buried too many children over their inability to critically engage in them. And, and, and having that happen as an educator led me to believe this is, this is as important as anything that I do, because it's tied to their identity. Right, that there's a lot that comes through the media that's trying to shape a certain kind of identity that's meant to build a consumer. But it's not necessarily good for kids. So part, part of helping to have powerful teaching is help students feel better about themselves. One of the reasons they don't feel great about themselves is because no one helps them interpret some of these images that they get through the media. Very few kids fit on the covers of Teen Vogue or cover Cosmo Girl, but a lot of them want to and feel inferior if they don't. So we think about these questions we begin with. How are students using popular culture? What do they consume? What do they create? What academic skills are they developing? And how can we connect it? And we find that there's, we can connect it across age groups, we can connect it across subject matter. We increase engagement, we increase relevance, we increase the possibility of success because we're tapping into things kids already feel confident being able to do. At the same time, we're able to have critical conversations about how media shapes its identity in positive and negative ways. So, um, a couple of ideas that this built on, I won't talk a lot about this, but uh, someone you might look up, Paul Ferry, uh, who is a really powerful educator, he says, true education must begin with the experiences of the people. Right? If to, to, to make it truly valuable, we have to start with who the kids are and where they are. Um, another one, who is a colleague of mine, is um, Gloria Latin billings talks about culturally relevant teaching. That um, education, at least part of it, has to help students develop and or maintain some cultural confidence. That is important to, to have a, you know, a firm belief of who you are. As one of my students said, um, how can I love learning if you're teaching me to hate the language my mother tells me she loves me? i got to say that again. Right? How can I respect you and love learning if you're teaching me to hate the language my mother tells me she loves me? That's said, well, who's doing that? Right? We're not saying hate your language hate your home life. But if part of education isn't helping you maintain some kind of sense of cultural confidence, that's what's happening. As a matter of fact, as a graduate student, I did not believe that I had language. The first time I learned that what African Americans spoke was actually language, I was 23 years old and almost at my master's degree. I almost broke down in tears. And it hadn't occurred to me that I spent most of my life believing that I did not have language. We had a broken language. And I remember it was on a Friday, I drove home and I told my brothers who were 15 and 16, guess what, we have a language. They're like, no we don't. We don't have a language, we speak ghetto, we speak broken English. And I almost broke down into it again. Because they were having trouble in school. And, and, and it dawned upon me that, that it comes at a cost. Right? If, if you're not continually affirmed, then that can be disaffirmed. It's not that anyone necessarily ever said that came out and disaffirmed, but the lack of any association of who you are, who you were with excellence, means disaffirmation by definition. The absence of affirmation is disaffirmation. So that was something that it took me as a graduate student to think about, and then to do that with my kids, right? That maintaining cultural confidence, being affirmed in who you are inside and outside of school is an important part of, it, an important part of making education relevant. 